Hello and welcome to Contemplations of the Lotus Eaters. This is episode number 23 and we're going to be talking about the crisis in the human sciences, the rep replicability crisis. Yes, uh, I can't even pronounce that. But <laughs> before we start, we we'll have a couple of announcements. So from this week on, contemplations are going to be premium. Uh, we, we're moving that in that direction so that it can be more in depth. The topics are going to be much more researched and we, we have more space to talk about this stuff. And so uh, hopefully it's going to be more interesting and more engaging and, and overall better. And so that's one half of it. And the other half is that on Sundays, uh, it's going to be the epochs of the Lotus Eaters, which is uh, going to be Carl uh, with Bo and the two of them are doing a great job at that already. There's four episodes by now. And so uh, check that out. And so Saturday is going to be Contemplations. Sunday is going to be Epochs, both premium. And there's a lot of free content by uh, our other writers and by us as well. And so it's not like you're missing anything. This is still going to be, uh, there's still going to be a lot of stuff and more stuff than ever before. So with that out of the way, uh, let's let's dive right into it. So. It's something, it's a topic that Josh has focused on a lot because it's his area of expertise. So I'm sure, yeah. sure he's going to be really excited to talk about it. So <laughs> take it away. <laughs> yeah. So um, obviously um, people have probably heard about the replicability crisis in the sciences. And it is, isn't just the human sciences or the social sciences, as people quite often say, that are at fault there's some degree of an issue in all fields of science. But... I'd probably argue that it's not as much of an issue as it might seem superficially because um, they say, oh, they, they can't replicate these findings. But then most uh, researchers and practitioners assume that, you know, all research findings should be taken with a pinch of salt. And they, they don't just say that and kind of still kind of take things at face value. Most um, established effects in the sciences have to be demonstrated in one research study to begin with and then replicated in lots of different ways or replicated the same way lots of different times. So we know that that's not just a kind of fluke result or an anomalous result and that you've got the evidence to suggest that actually this this is getting at a, a real thing, a real phenomenon, and it's it's not just a product of poor experimental design or statistical anomalies or something like that. And this is something that I'm going to focus on in particular in the field of human sciences because, of course, the practices differ between various different sciences. So it would so it wouldn't what's seem. The, what's the difference between social and human sciences? Well, the human sciences just means sciences that study human beings, okay. I mean, who would have guessed? But the, the kind of social science side of things is things like sociology, the, the social psychology uh, part of it, anthropology. Mm -hmm. um, so you need to think of my, my particular field of psychology as a bit of a, uh, a Venn diagram where it overlaps with biology on the one side with things like neuroscience and the clinical psychology side of things. and and then on the other side, in the, the social science side, you've got the social psychology, which overlaps with things like sociology and anthropology, mm -hmm. which uh, study societies. And but and the, so, the, so with, with this replicability crisis, mm -hmm. that sounds a bit like a niche topic. So why is it important? Why is it important whether studies can be replicated or not in the human sciences? Well, because you, you want to be able to take the, the findings of these studies and say okay this is actually getting at something real there's not it's not just making stuff up um about the world you want to be able to read the conclusions of a study and be able to say okay well i can i can believe this because there is sufficient evidence for it and if you can't replicate the findings it means that there isn't sufficient evidence for the conclusions and it's also pro like a problem because people might be operating under the assumption that these these research findings are true and they're acting as if they are you know things that are accurate when they may otherwise not be and this is something that is uh, very important to stress about media <laughs> coverage of research studies where um, the media will be like there's been a new study that proves this and I absolutely <laughs> loathe it like it's they're completely missing the point yeah. of science yeah. in that you, you only really have evidence for something once it's been demonstrated multiple times over the course of a long period of study. You, you want to at least have something known as a meta-analysis yeah. where um, it's, 
it evaluates all of the individual studies um, and kind and tries to get some kind of cohesive uh, understanding of it and whether okay this is actually reliable or the the published research is conflicting so it's mm. difficult to say which direction it goes right um, yeah, I mean that that approach by the media is even worse given that all the big publishing houses, not, not publishing houses, but all the big media, all the big presses have their own science correspondence, right? Which mm -hmm. are like half journalism, half science. And so that's their specialty. And so what they're supposed to do is to take stuff out of science, understand them in a better way than normal people or other people would understand it, and then put it in a nice journalistic package where, where people can understand it easily and it's readable, right? So mm -hmm. that's their job. It's not like someone who spent their whole time, whole, whole life, um, like studying history or philosophy, are uh, just suddenly going to go like look at a biological study and report on it. Like, that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. so, so it's even worse because that's that those people's jobs, right? Well, some of it is quite good. Like I, I've I've read some of the pop psychology uh, articles, and th they're not bad. They they're getting at the gist of what the literature mm. says. But sometimes it can be a bit hit and miss. Um, and I think it depends just on the journalist in question. Right. Sometimes you get journalists that just look at stuff, and they're, they're just like, "Yes, I I understand this, even though I have no scientific training." And those are the ones you need to watch out for because they they miss the point of what science is about. Yeah. And I think what people don't understand as well is that there are two competing theories of scientific knowledge. There's the one theory um, that says that science builds over time. It's a gradual process of you, you keep on conducting studies over time. And as these studies go on and on, you, you can start to have more confidence in the findings, assuming that they're conclusive and not conflicting. Then you can say, OK, well, it seems like something's going on. But there's also a paradigm view, which mm. is that um, a, a study comes along that um, just disproves something. Um, this, this is the most ex extreme example. Normally, um, like in actual scientific practice, you'll, you'll find studies that have anomalous results to the current prevailing theory, the one that's favoured by most of the uh, specialists mm. in that field and there'll be these anomalous results that they can't really explain and then eventually there's a study that proposes okay maybe there's a better explanation here and then the paradigm shifts and this is a theory that was kind of coined by the philosopher of science Thomas Kuhn in his 1962 book The Structure of Scientific Revolutions which is hugely influential and I'm mm -hmm. sure pretty much every scientific practitioner has probably heard of it um, or at least is familiar with the the ideas that are proposed in it and so why 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 this whole thing is important is not is because it doesn't just stay in the sciences if there is a re replicability crisis it doesn't just stay among the scientists where mm -hmm. they are discussing something that is wrong and something that is not real it goes beyond that right it goes to the general public it goes to the politicians it goes to like businesses and everyone right Absolutely, and everyone yeah. then kind of Mm -hmm. operates under this false assumption so it can have far-reaching social consequences just because some scientists are, would be talking about something that is not really true if that were the case yeah well science is meant to be something that's pushing the boundaries of mm -hmm. human knowledge isn't it and if we want to learn new things or reevaluate our current understanding of things in the face of new evidence then we want that evidence to be reliable and we want to be making our decisions on evidence obviously we're not just gonna blindly just say okay I'm gonna believe this and that's that well some people do that but I don't approve don't do that <laughs> the wiggling finger yes yeah, you know I'm annoyed when I get get that out I'm like an Ayatollah but um, <laughs> this this is a particular problem mm -hmm. because um, replicability is obviously reliant on scientists having the resources to be able to um, evaluate other people's studies or their own studies and follow up research um, or trying to replicate the studies using the exact methodology that the the kind of original practitioner or researcher um, had used and the problem is that at the minute scientific growth is so large that um, the, the publication of original studies far outweighs uh, current science's ability to uh, kind of peer review the, right. the research and replication as we'll see later on isn't always something that is particularly 
uh, looked with favour in the scientific community. Obviously, you can just imagine having your own original scientific ideas seems to go down better than just saying, OK, well, I've just been picking faults with other researchers' stuff. Like, it, yeah. there's less yeah. esteem to be had there. And um, I think that's something that we will discuss later, but it's certainly a factor in it. But supposedly, 4% um, of, um, of papers... Mm -hmm. um, what, no, I've, I framed that really badly. So every year, <laughs> there is an increase of 4% in research papers being published. That's huge. And that is in... And that's been the case for the past 30 years or so. That's massive. So, yeah. Um, it's getting to the point now where millions of scientific papers are being published a year. So what you're saying worldwide. is science is overfunded? Well, no. <laughs> because... Well, that's what a scientist would say. Well, I'm not, not practising as a scientist anymore, so... I can be trusted, I, I, I promise. <laughs> so scientists can be trusted, Josh. It's a hot take. Well, some scientists, obviously. But the, the fact that research is growing to this extent means that there's, there's difficulties in reviewing all of the evidence. Right. And obviously the most important papers get the most attention and uh, quite often the influential papers are the ones that people try to replicate. So it's not like the, the replication efforts are distributed along kind of an even spread where mm -hmm. even the papers that get no recognition whatsoever um, are being attempted to be replicated because there's no point in doing that in the first place. So the ones that are actually um, capturing the public imagination, for want mm -hmm. of a better way of putting it, are the ones that people are seeking to replicate in what replication attempts they have. But um, it's... They, they quite often find that um, their replication doesn't succeed. Um, and that is the, the crux of the problem here. Right. And so, so the million dollar question, I guess, is, is there a replicability crisis? Um, to watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.